Happiness is well-being, from contentment to joy, it's satisfaction. Um, for a long time, philosophers have thought of happiness as one of humanity's highest goods, uh, desirable in and of itself, not just for the sake of some other good. Uh, in the sense, happiness is a fundamental societal metric of uh, societal well-being, welfare. Uh, however, happiness has often been overshadowed by more readily quantifiable indicators, such as gross domestic product, financial inequality. But as we set our goals and define metrics for success in society, it's important to, to look beyond that which happens to be convenient to quantify. And so today I'm going to be talking about our, our attempt to, to measure happiness at a national and global scale using large-scale texts. So we study Twitter. Um, this is a map of the geographical distribution of uh, our data set. Each white dot represents a tweet. Um, we have roughly 3 billion messages in our data set, and this map corresponds to about 20 million of them, so it's 10% of our data set. Uh, those 3 billion messages come from 50 million unique users around the globe. You can see from the different white distributions that some areas of the world we receive a higher volume of tweets from, the US, uh, Europe, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Australia filling out there, South Africa, South America, Central America, all over the world we get these tweets from. So uh, to our idea is, is to measure happiness as, as related to text. To do this, we have a set of over 10,000 words, 10,000 of the most frequently used words in the English language, each of which has a score associated with it. Um, Think of positive, happy words, happiness, cupcakes, victory, attraction, paradise. These are all words in our data set, and they all have very high scores, close to nine. On the other end of the scale, we have more negative, sad words, suffer, depressing, terrorist, and they all have very low scores, close to one. But it's not just happy and sad, we have everything. So we have neutral words and, and everything in between, the entire spectrum of, of emotions. So to, to quantify uh, the emotional content in large-scale texts, we take the average of uh, the happiness scores of the individual words weighted by how frequently they appear in the text. So this allows us uh, to, to do things like measure societal trends in happiness. For example, uh, can think of the happiness of people, of bloggers in different age brackets. So uh, in this figure, I have the f um, blogger age on the horizontal axis with, uh, and the vertical axis is the average sentiment, the emotional content in those different bloggers' posts. So you can see this very clear trend that in the early stages of life, as people are teenagers, the sentiment of their posts is, is very negative. It, as people age, it continues to increase, peaking in the middle-aged years, and then taking a downward trend in the later stages of life. So to understand what, what led to these differences, why are, for example, teenagers, why do we perceive them as less happy than, than people in their middle-aged years? We can. Uh, take a look at this plot. So this plot compares the words that teenagers were using to those of middle-aged people, with the up arrows indicating words that teenagers are using more frequently, and the red color indicating that uh, those words are, are negative or sad words. So we can see from this plot, teenagers compared to 45-year-olds are more often saying uh, mad, hurt, fat, sick, uh, stupid, depressed. Um, so they're disproportionately using, using these negative words. We thought it was really fascinating that you can observe this kind of intuitive life trend 
uh, using this sentiment analysis approach. Um, but if you can zoom out and you can think about not just happiness trends in individuals, but um, the, uh, the overall happiness signal of, of, a, of a society. So we've been collecting tweets for over three years now, and this time series represents um, the overall happiness signal that we observed from October 2010 to uh, September in 2011, so it's one year of data. On the vertical axis, we have the average sentiment of uh, messages that we observed, and each dot corresponds to one day of the year. So you can see, starting on the left, working back in time, we have the 9-11 anniversary, the most recent anniversary of the September 11th attacks, the World Trade Center registering as a notably more negative day on, on Twitter. So people on that day were using sadder, more negative words. Uh, shortly before then, you have this increased negativity corresponding to the time of the London, riot, London riots breaking out uh, in response to the, the death of a civilian by police shooting. Before that, Amy Winehouse dies, another sad day on Twitter. Uh, and then, of, of course, the death of Osama bin Laden, people were using uh, notably more negative words. Uh, if we move upward on the, to the more positive end of the scale, we have holidays, people sending lots of nice greetings to each other, uh, and, and so forth. And then, of course, the, the royal wedding um, made people happy. So, so using this approach, using the we have these happiness scores for words, we can do things like measure societal trends and happiness. It's it's maybe a just the beginning of an idea, and it's crude in some ways. And uh, but we to curb some of the error, we agree that we only look at these very large, large scale texts, and uh, maybe as a result, the subtle contextual differences in word meaning don't have as much, uh, don't carry as much weight. Um, but you can also think about studying happiness in another framework with language. So we've been talking about happiness in people's use of language, and also think about the emotional spectrum of language itself. Um, so. Here's what we find. This is a picture of, um, so we have this, these three billion messages on Twitter. And if you think about the 5,000 most frequently, so wh which words do people use most frequently? Take the, five, take the 5,000 most frequently used words. Um, consider the, the happiness of each of those words. On the horizontal axis, I have the happiness of those words. And on the vertical axis is the fraction of words of those 5,000 with the corresponding happiness. And you can see this really striking bias in that there are significantly more positive words than negative words. The positivity significantly outweighs the negativity. Um, and so we thought, well, is this maybe uh, the, something unique about Twitter? You know, it's a social media. There's a unique use of language. So we, we consider different, these four different corpuses. So we have here the same plot, um, this positive bias on Twitter and the plot that I repeated from the last slide. Um, we have the top 5,000 most frequently used words in American English books taken from the Google data set, another striking positive bias. Positive words far outweigh the negative. Uh, the top 5,000 most frequently used words found in the New York Times over the past 20 years. The top 5,000 words found in music lyrics from the 1960s onward. So in each case, we see, uh, we see that this positivity tends to outweigh the negativity if we think about language as a, an instrument of communication, um, it's interesting to, to think what this positive bias might reflect about our culture and our um, social natures. So I talk about happiness and 
of course, ha measuring happiness is more complicated than um, assigning scores to words and averaging what people say. But um, as we move forward and our metrics continue to improve, hopefully they diversify and they become more refined. And in general, that happiness will begin to be taken more seriously as a factor that is important to both aim for, take the time to take the time and energy to prioritize and to, to measure. So thank you.